And he just said, you know, uh, with, a, with words of disgust, as he s- noticed, he smelled the fish. <laughs> That somebody brought fish to potluck. And I think the Holy Spirit gave me a little bit of boldness. Yeah, they don't teach this in seminary, okay? And uh, I, I said to him, what do you do with the fact that Jesus ate fish? Right? And he looked at me and he said, but Jesus didn't have all the truth. He didn't have Ellen White. See, if Jesus had Ellen White, he would have known he's supposed to be vegetarian. The Lineage Journey Podcast, unscripted conversations that aim to help you on the journey of discovering your lineage. Join us as we take a deeper look into past lineage episodes and see the lessons we can learn for today. Today we have with us a special guest. His name is Dr. Michael Campbell. He lives in Keene, Texas, where he is a professor at Southwestern Adventist University. He has been teaching there for about three years. Prior to that, he was teaching in the Philippines at a at a university there for about six years. And prior to that, he was pastoring at some churches in the United States of America. He is an expert in Adventist history. In particular, he has written a book called 1919 that looks at the subject we're going to be talking about today. We're glad that he's able to join us and he has a special insight. So listen carefully as we go into this interview and see the implications of what this event in the past had for our lives and the way we look at scripture and study today. Today for our podcast interview, we're blessed to have a very special guest with us coming all the way from Texas. We have Dr. Michael Campbell. He is a professor at Southwestern Adventist University. And on the topic we're going to speak on in just a few moments, I'd consider him to be a foremost expert on this subject. Dr. Campbell, thank you for joining us from Texas, where you're based. Um, what's the name of the town again, uh, where Southwestern is? I forget. We're in Keene, just to the southwest of Fort Worth. And thank you for having me. Keene, that's right. I, I spent a few t- uh, winters there actually coal portering in that area. So I'm a little bit familiar with it, but gl- glad you could join us. and. Thanks for taking the time to be with us here on this Lineage Privilege. Journey podcast. Um, we're going to be discussing the 1919 Bible Conference. I, you wrote a book on this 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 subject. What was the title of your book? 1919: The Untold Story of Adventism Struggle with uh, Fundamentalism. Okay, okay. Um, maybe I'm different to others. Maybe I'm not the norm. Maybe I'm just uneducated. Um, but personally, I hadn't really heard much about this conference in my casual amateur perusal of Adventist history. I, I consider myself to be someone who enjoys or likes history a fair bit. I had read, you know, Tell It to the World and all these other books on typical Adventist history um, from, from my own personal study and also in college when I took history classes. Now, but I'd never really heard about the 1919 Bible Conference. Now, you've written a book on this. What would you say was your motivation behind writing the book? Was it a passion of yours? Was it that you saw that? It wasn't spoken about enough. Is it a bit of both or is it something else? Just kind of give us an insight as to why you you, you felt a a motivation to write that book in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, uh, part of it, what goes back to college, just like you, I've I've had a passion for Adventist history since I was a young person, just really inspired by how God has led in the past with the pioneers of our church. Uh, but then when I got to college, I we had a senior historiography class and my uh, major professor back then, Ben MacArthur, had assigned different topics for those senior history majors to explore a little bit more in depth. And I was assigned this topic. And so here I was, uh, similar to you, having read Mervyn Maxwell's Tell It to the World. In fact, he was probably one of the most instrumental people in getting me really interested as a teenager in Adventist history, just telling the story so inspirational where they became came to life as, you know, here are our pioneers as young people who love the Lord, love to study scripture. And so, in fact, I remember Dr. Maxwell telling me, you know, Michael, you really need to be thinking about if, if you're really passionate about Adventist history, doing your doctorate and eventually 
you know, uh, maybe God will open the door for you to teach Adventist history, which all of that's worked out. Uh, but I remember him specifically telling me, Michael, think about a topic in the 20th century. Mm. And so he was a very mentoring kind of person. And I realized this was an opportunity, some gentle nudging. And so when I got to the, you know, point in, in my life where, you know, I'm, I'm getting to be a senior in college, thinking about a senior topic that I'm going to write on. And so I was encouraged by my major professor, Ben MacArthur, as I mentioned, you know, why don't you pursue this? So that kind of fit within what Dr. Maxwell had recommended. And I kind of had kept in touch with him. He continued to be a mentor uh, for me while he was still alive. Of course, he passed away some years ago. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so 1919, here, here was a 20th century topic. And so I wrote on it, uh, you know, looking back, I saw it in the drawer <laughs> a couple of years ago when we were moving and, and I saw this, this old senior paper and I, I, I'd probably be very, well, I am very embarrassed by it. It's the best I could do. I was, I was a student in college, it was my first attempt. And, but, but what really stuck out for me, Adam, was uh, as I read those transcripts for the first time, were these very poignant conversations hmm. that are taking place right after Ellen White's death about how to interpret her writings, her mm -hmm. prophetic ministry, her authority, all of that, which is incredibly relevant. So as I read those, and I, you know, I did the best I could as a student at the time. And, and of course, later on, you know, I wrote my senior paper on that and kind of dropped it for a while and been a couple of years. And then I, I, I went on to do my, my graduate studies. And then I was looking for a dissertation topic uh, of course, Maxwell was, was, uh, had passed away by that time. And, uh, I, I remembered my senior thesis topic. And at that point I realized, uh, and I wanted to actually write on Adventism and fundamentalism more broadly. Hmm. Uh, but I was kind of encouraged, Hey, you know, you have the rest of your life to write on this topic. So just narrow it down. And so here I am once again, uh, with some of my major professors encouraging me and my and now at the graduate level, hey, why don't you explore this? And so sort of this love from college reignited and I realized, hey, you know, this is actually very practical. Uh, and, and so I wrote my dissertation on 1919, trying to unpack even into much greater depth now, uh, providing the context mm -hmm. for 1919. So um, I can resonate with what you're saying. It wasn't really a lot written about mm -hmm. this. It, it did make a splash in Adventism in the late 70s, early 80s because of other issues going on within the church. And what I sought to do was to try to provide some context and historical nuance and accuracy to what actually happened and why that event is uh, significant for, for Seventh-day mm -hmm. Adventists today and why it deserves to be included when we talk about Adventist history, when we teach it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So 1919, I guess we'll, we'll unpack this more as we go along, but, sure. and I'm asking you to condense a life research so far, or, or, you know, your thesis, your PhD into, you know, yeah. what's going to be 30, 40 minutes as we, as we talk about it here. <laughs> but what would you say are the main issues, if you could summarize it and say like two or three issues, and then we'll kind of maybe mm -hmm. unpack those, those further, yeah. those main issues of 1919, what was the fallout and, and, and so on? Yeah, um, great. And I, I, I kind of sense we were headed towards, uh, I didn't want to beat you to the punch on the whole, uh, but but yeah, the significance of it. And I, I think really just boiling it down to a nutshell, it really comes to how do we faithfully in a healthy and balanced way interpret inspired writings? And this uh, relates to both the Bible and to Ellen White. Of course, it's probably best remembered for the very, very uh, um, candid conversations at the very end of the meeting by the Bible and history teachers trying to make sense of how that works with Ellen White specifically. So uh, really, we're dealing with uh, hermeneutics, uh, which, you know, you know, going back to Jesus on the road to Emmaus, it talks about how he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures that that word interpreted is that Greek word hermeneuo. Uh, and so that's where we get this word hermeneutics. So I would say in a nutshell, the 1919 Bible conference is all about hermeneutics. And to kind of unpack that, the related issues to that is inspiration. How do we correctly interpret inspired writings? What is the authority of inspired writings? Uh, for example, how do we connect and relate 
the authority of the Bible to the authority of Ellen White. Obviously, they're from the same source, but but how do we how do we connect those two? Which which one has is is you know does one have greater primacy or authority? How, how did Ellen White understand her own writing? So, what would be the legacy of Ellen White's prophetic authority within the Seventh Day Adventist Church after her death? And 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 this is the first major discussion by church thinkers, administrators about her authority and how to interpret her writings after her death. Now, it's only four years earlier, 1915, that Ellen White dies. So mm-hmm. 1919, uh, and and so that really is at the center of what the 1919 Bible Conference is all about. Mm. How we understand inspiration and how we interpret it. And I think, like you say, that's, that's something right. we, we've been grappling with for a long time. You know, you go to a church, you hear a preacher or someone gives a presentation and they, they read a quote and that, that quote is is the you know, you don't know how they've interpreted it, what the context is, but that's that's the motivation to do something. And I think that's something we all struggle with. So, okay, um, maybe if I could ask you a broader question before we kind of sure. zero in on some of these things you, you've looked at, and that would be, what would, would you say were some of the the issues in Christianity at large at the time, and how did that impact, you know, what Adventism was going through at the time? You know, what what was yeah. the broader yeah. church of you know, Christianity dealing with? Yeah, you know, great question, because, uh, you know, Adventism didn't happen in a vacuum. They're, they lived within a specific historical context. And I, I think this is absolutely crucial for understanding our early Adventist pioneers and, and for understanding 1919. I think probably um, a couple events in particular really stand out for me. Uh, one that really surprised me as I was doing my historical research on my dissertation now, what, 15 years ago, uh, was the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That created a lot of anxiety. You know, historians debate that somewhere between 50 to 100 million people around the world died. And I thought, oh, how terrible that is. And that was probably one of the things I thought, well, that's that, you know, how could that ever happen again? And here we are in the middle of the mm. COVID-19. Yeah. And I've been going back to all my notes from my dissertation, writing a whole series of articles on the whole 19, how Adventists responded to the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, mm. uh, which is closely related to World War One. So you have a the mm-hmm. whole, this major global conflict centered in Europe where massive casualties people died on a level unseen in human history up until that point uh, so those are a couple of things in the the wider world I, I think within religion specifically in American context at that time you have what is the rise of what becomes known as the fundamentalist movement um, this was a specific historical movement I know we use the term fundamentalism Islamic extremist terrorist whatever uh, that will uh, do something crazy, and so we call that fundamentalism. But but we're talking about uh, now not not just in the broader sense, but in a more specific historical sense of the historical fundamentalist movement in American Christianity. And this movement was a reaction to liberal trends within American religion uh, to undermine the Bible, the historical critical method that's kind of taking away the supernatural from the inspired writings doubting the narrative of creation. And so you have evolution trying. So these sort of modernist professors are trying to revise or rewrite the Bible without the supernatural emphasis uh, that, that had been widely accepted before then. So the fundamentalists were a group of conservative Christians who basically are reacting. They're saying, hey, uh, this is wrong. And they're very militant. Remember, this is during World War One. They publish a whole series of tracts and pamphlets, uh, kind of attacking those things that they see that they're that they're against, mm-hmm. that are undermining Christianity. So this rising historical fundamentalist movement, um, Adventists saw themselves very much a part of that. I mean, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Adventists affirm the primacy; they take a high view of Scripture. We have always historically done that, and so they saw themselves in alignment because they had a common enemy. Uh, but the problem is, is that the fundamentalists uh, were largely Calvinist and had some kind of theological issues that, as 
some of a, a younger generation came along the scenes, they began to become very influenced by these fundamentalist ideas. And what's significant for 1919, since we don't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. but just really kind of, I, I, I'm kind of very loosely connecting the dots, but uh, what's significant is that a lot of fundamentalists began to push a very hard and rigid, or maybe even you might say a narrow uh, wooden view of revelation and inspiration, almost like, you know, um, and so we call this inerrancy, this kind of mm -hmm. very hard, wooden, literalistic kind of way of interpreting inspired writings. And that became very common in fundamentalist circles. Uh, within Adventism, we had not historically ever taught that. We taught thought inspiration. Go back to 1883, mm -hmm. the church voted a statement on thought inspiration. Ellen White was always very flexible when it came to explaining her understanding of, of, of thought inspiration. You look to the uh, introduction to the book, Great Controversy. I mean, that's probably her best statement on inspiration, but there are others, but it's very clear. She was definitely not in the inerrantist camp. She took a high view of scripture, but inerrancy, no way. Uh, but here's the kicker is 1919 comes along. You have people now trying to take this fundamentalist concept of inerrancy and trying to apply it to Adventism, trying to apply it to the Bible, and specifically where it became very problematic is trying to apply it to Ellen White mm. in her mm. writings. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we still have that struggle today between thought and verbal inspiration, even that conversation right. still it, it doesn't just rumble on it. It's front and center in a lot of people's it, minds, it, isn't it? And what a lot of people I think don't realize is that this is a very modern construct or a modern innovation imposed upon Adventism. And it doesn't really um, go back to Ellen White or the early Adventist pioneers. So we're we're actually kind of re revising or re envisioning what is Adventism. Would you say like we regressed in our view of inspiration around that time by in, by the influence of the world? Probably, and it might be a little bit overly simplistic to say that as a historian. I'm always mm -hmm. trying to be very precise, but probably in a very general sense, I would mm -hmm. I would agree with that. So there's these issues of fundamentalism uh, that impact Adventism, you know. So would would Darwinism have an impact as well at this time or, or not really on this conference? Or is that just a... Not so much. I mean, it wasn't a major topic at 1919 and for scholars of fundamentalism. Uh, and I, I've, you know, covered the territory fairly well, I think. Um, I, you know, the whole issue of creation evolution, that's not a topic that really generates a lot of buzz within American Christianity until the mid-1920s, okay. 1922 onwards to this famous or infamous Scopes Scope, trial yeah. of 1926. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a later thing, and that, that kind of happens post-1919. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Just yeah. maybe a maybe not a main question, but I, I've I've read and and heard that the the nineteen nineteen conference was kind of like an invite only conference. It wasn't a you know broadly publicized, and you know some people thought sure. it was secret and and so on, so on and so forth. And you know, yeah. did did that add to the mystery, or did that add to why it was quiet afterwards as well, or wasn't much published on it afterwards? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and. And, you know, it was an invitation only event. Our church has a lot of these kinds of events. You know, I've, I've attended a number of these uh, international Bible conferences at the General Conference mm -hmm. Biblical Research Institute. You have to be a religion teacher to attend or, a, you know, they have certain criteria. You can't just walk in the door because they expect that if you're going to be hashing out theological issues, they want someone that has a certain, you know, they want religion teachers um, and scholars to be a part of that conversation. And and that's my take of 1919 is really the same thing is that church leaders set some expectations. We want church administrators, we want editors of our papers, and we want Bible and history teachers to be there. And we want to be able to have the kind of candid conversations on issues the church is facing without kind of broadcasting them to the world. Uh, and, and part of the little bit of the context back then is you have some people that were attacking church leaders um, as uh, that are heavily, heavily influenced by the rising fundamentalist movement. Probably the best uh, known examples are J.S. Washburn and Claude Holmes. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but they're clearly teaching inerrancy, um, 
Holmes famously would write a number of pamphlets where he'd talk about Ellen White's writings and say, they are scripture to me. They are, I mean, he's clearly teaching inerrancy. Every word is inerrant. And so he believes that Daniels and Prescott and other church leaders who are very prominent at 1919 are basically in apostasy. So um, you're, you're not going to invite the people that are writing you hate mail <laughs> yeah. to go show up and 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 uh, be able to cause a ruckus in the middle of, of a very sensitive church uh, meeting. And, and, and so the church, um, the general conference, the opening night of the 1919 Bible conference, Daniels is very clear. He says, this is an invitation only event. You have to be invited by the general conference committee in order to be able to participate in these meetings. Here's our list of delegates and so on. And they move on. Now, I don't think it was necessarily secret per se, because um, they're writing about this in church publications, mm -hmm. in the Review and Herald. There's a number of reports. Here's the consensus statement of the participants. Here's what we talked about. Uh, there are excerpts of different presentations at the 1990 Bible Conference that later are published as articles or in book form. So I don't get the sense that this was some kind of secret meeting where people were trying to somehow, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes. My, my sense is that um, church leaders were trying to act in a very responsible way, which leads to the question, I think, where you might, might be heading is, you know, why didn't we know more about it, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think really the answer to that's quite simple. It was just one of many historical events that took place that year. And around that time, there were, you know, I forget, I'd have to look in my notes, but I think there were 20 something um, conferences that the church held. Um, and so it's one of many conferences. And so people didn't see it as particularly noteworthy. It's only noteworthy to us in the, as historians, we look back and say, oh, that's actually really significant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't have anybody that was there that left a memory statement and said, you know, um, it's, you know, kind of like September 11, you know, everybody remembers where they were mm -hmm. and what was happening and what their thoughts were of a major event that happened in the world or a major event that happened in the church. They just saw that as just another meeting and uh, moving along. And so I and that's that's how history is sometimes history. It's only with hindsight that we begin to see truly the significance. Exactly. So this was the first time, though, we'd had a, a conference where you had kind of Adventist leaders and scholars assembled for the purpose of of studying a particular issue. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, in a way, I mean, you go all the way back to the earliest beginnings, as you well know, uh, that our church was founded in the midst of Bible conferences, right? Sure. So you have yeah, the yeah. what we tend to call the Sabbath and Sanctuary Sabbath. Conferences. Mm -hmm. The 1880s, 1890s, you have a whole series of Bible institutes, which were something similar. But what makes 1919 significant, I think, is the broad scope where it's not just doing training pastors, per se. These are actually taking all the experts in the denomination, religion teachers, history teachers, some that had graduate degrees for the first time, and enough mm -hmm. people had training in biblical languages that they could debate the nuances of different uh, Greek and Hebrew grammar. And so this is a level of sophistication that's never been seen before. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, yes, it is really unprecedented. This, this is uh, something new and unique and would become basically the first of three major series of Bible conferences that the church would have through the 20th century. I mean, when I when I hear the, the sound of that, to me, it, uh, I think there's some time in need for that. And they, they may this just apply in it today where, where scholars or experts in the particular field get together and they can they can discuss a particular yeah. issues and maybe share some of their mm -hmm. doubts on a subject or just kind of hash it out in an environment where you're not going to be judged for voicing your thoughts. Lineage is a non-profit organization kept running by generous donors like you. Support us today on patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. History shapes identity. Identity shapes mission. And a clear mission determines the trajectory of your future. Knowing where you come from is key to understanding your present purpose and your future mission. Lineage Journey is a series of videos that will take you on a journey through time, discovering the key people and events that have shaped the Christian faith. From the Waldenses to Martin Luther to Zwingli, from England to France, Switzerland to Germany, the light broke over the horizon of Europe, piercing through the dark ages and then spread out over the world. 
As the United States of America rose to supremacy, Christianity formed the bedrock of this great nation. And so from the Great Awakening to the Great Disappointment and beyond, Lineage follows the journey of God's church throughout time, immersing you in the places, the stories, and the people through whom Christianity has shone the brightest. Join us on a journey through time. Follow us on social media at Lineage Journey or check out our website at lineagejourney.com. Lineage Journey not only produces video content, but instructive and illuminating resources to teach young and old about Christian history. Lineage has produced an educational coloring book for people of all ages. It includes original artwork from Ashley Bloom, highlighting the various heroes of the Reformation. Each scene has a matching story, and there are also QR codes to connect you to the website for more information and to watch the videos. There are also fun facts and memorable quotes to accompany the scenes to color in. Designed for young and old alike, get your copy now at lineagejourney.com. Kind of going back to the, the I guess, the, the main issue that you mentioned, the role of inspiration, whether it's biblical or, or Ellen White. Um, yeah. I mean, now the prophet is, like you, you mentioned earlier, she she died in July 1919. 19, so she's been dead for about four years now. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm guess it, it's hard for us to imagine what the difference would have been like to having a live prophet versus, you know, someone that's not in the, the early pioneers. The original pioneers are dying off and there's not many left anymore. And now you have a situation where it's people who knew her as opposed to, you know, people who had... Or people who knew people who knew her, and and uh, right. the church is transitioning from we'd always had a li- a prophet alive, and now we have a, a a dead prophet who can't speak for herself anymore. And you know, I guess we we still struggle with that even more so today because we're further removed from Ellen White. So, in what way did you, do you think that the the way Ellen White's writings were interpreted? Um, then, or, or the issues that they, they, they grappled with them. How has that rumbled on today, and what, what are the long-standing kind of implications for how we the, uh, view her writings, or how we how we uh, interpret them? Yeah, great, great question. You know, uh, Ellen White dies July 16, 1915, and so when she actually dies, you're right. The church has to deal without a living prophet, and. You know, as I read the different accounts, uh, and I was just reading through this last year, the Review and Herald through the 19 teens and 20s, just page by page, um, just reading it through and really kind of sinking in, getting a grasp of of all the articles and the ethos of, of that era. It was a time of mourning for the church. You know, you think of Samuel when he died, the Bible says that all of uh, Rama died, I mean, uh, mourned and Israel mourned and just this time of, of, of collective mourning. So there's a sense of loss. There's a sense that, that times have changed and what to, what to expect. And, and people really were wondering, you know, will there be another prophet? Um, in fact, that's still a question people ask, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, will there be another prophet? Uh, and I'm working actually on a book, um, on the different people that have claimed to have the prophetic gift. I'm going to give about a, a dozen or of my a dozen mm-hmm. or so of my favorite examples of, of people who've claimed to be prophets that turned out to not be prophets. Um, and I've met several personally. I had someone come to my office last summer and saying, the word of the Lord comes to me, you know, and mm-hmm. and if someone comes and says and claims that they're a prophet, right, Adam? I mean, what do you do? Yeah, you've got to look into it, I guess. Yeah, you listen and you weigh it by mm-hmm. the prophetic word that's been given. So mm-hmm. you take it to the scripture. Is it in harmony of scripture? Well, right away, this person didn't want to talk scripture. So they, uh, you know, said, I, you know, you know, flames are going to come down from heaven and consume me, but I'm still here. Uh, but I, I actually took seriously. I wanted to listen, but I'm going to weigh and evaluate it by the Bible. And that's how our pioneers did it. That's how Ellen 
White saw herself is, you know, don't take my word for it. Study the scriptures, um, the authority of the scriptures. Go to the scriptures and that they have our primal authority. Well, right after Ellen White's death, you have uh, probably the most famous example of someone claiming to be Ellen White's prophetic successor, and that is Margaret Rowan. Los Angeles, recent convert, uh, came from a Methodist home. Lots of parallels with mm-hmm. Ellen Harmon in her early life and, and, and her calling, prophetic calling. Uh, but as time goes on, she starts making grandiose claims that eventually uh, goes to show that she's not a true prophet. But that sort of, those claims are ongoing at the time of the 1919 Bible Conference. So that, that, that's like this major controversy for about 10 years in the denomination from about 1916 to 1926. Mm-hmm. And she eventually gets into time setting. Anyways, I don't want to get too mm-hmm. much into her story, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it is interesting, right, uh, to, to see. And, and so there's a sense of loss. There's a sense of expectancy. There's questions. Will there be another prophet? Uh, and what do we do with this prophetic uh, corpus, this, this live, the, all of these writings published and unpublished? How will, how will the church curate them? How will they? And, and so you're right. Um, there's an older generation that has worked closely with Ellen White during her lifetime. And they have a much more flexible view or hermeneutic of revelation and inspiration. Many of them have helped Ellen White to make historical revisions of the great controversy. Again, she never claimed to be a historian. So her passion in writing the great controversy is to talk about what's going on from a cosmic conflict Mm -hmm. stand. Uh, And so one of the famous examples at 1919 was, uh, and and about that time that was being debated was the, uh, in in Paris uh, with the whole... Uh, French Revolution and St. Bartholomew's Massacre, whether there were clouds in the sky or not. And as time went on, they found, oh, well, there's really not and and better historical sources. And frankly, I don't think Ellen White cared whether there were clouds in the sky. She just wanted a good historical source. But she was care- what she cared passionately about was what this particular historical event meant in the context of this greater meta narrative Mm -hmm. of this again this cosmic conflict between christ and satan so if she found a better historical source she used it and asked for people to help her to find better historical sources right so this you know the people at 1919 this older generation like prescott daniels and others had worked closely with ellen white had helped her find sources in for example the great controversy Herbert Camden Lacey was another person at 1919. Again, worked closely with Ellen White. Uh, So you see that there is this sort of older generation. They're trying to pass on this sort of understanding of Ellen White, how she worked based on their personal interactions and what they saw. And they're not trying to undermine Ellen White. They're trying to say, hey, this is our experience. Daniel stops the delegates at four different points during the meeting and says, hey, I just let me tell you my own experience with Ellen White. Right. So so there's this sort of and, and there's this younger generation that's coming along and very influenced by fundamentalism and very almost kind of militant, I would say. And they they see this flexible view of Ellen White as somehow being uh, threatening to what they hope will be an inerrant Ellen White. And so. Uh, and, and, and taking a view where Ellen White is elevated as superior to scripture. So in other words, wow. the only way to read the Bible is through the lens of Ellen White, right? So it's sort of this reversal that's going on. Um, and so you have at 1919, Adam, two groups, two hermeneutical schools. And of course, there's some nuance there, but in a very broad, in the broadest possible sense. Uh, and, and they actually begin self-identifying as the... Uh, traditionalists or the conservatives against the progressives. Uh, and so, and, and anybody, you know, I've been a pastor long enough that I probably can empathize, mm-hmm. you know, where you run into a church and you see people start using these labels, right, of conservatives mm-hmm. against the liberals. This is the first time in Adventist history I really see that kind of phenomena happening in an Adventist context. And, and that's what's taking place at. 1919 is these two groups and they're debating and at at times it was even I would say acrimonious where uh, there were very strong strongly held feelings in fact uh, some of the debates are taking place in the context of prophetic interpretation 
king of the north, king of the south, Daniel 11, that kind of thing. Daniels gets so frustrated. He says, I just wish I could take Daniel 11 and put it in a hot air balloon and let it just <laughs> float away. <laughs> you can see here's a frustrated church administrator, right? Mm. And that's, that's what he was. He was not a theologian. He was a church administrator. So he's trying to find a way to make the peace, right? And bring people together. And I, it's almost sort of this logic that if we could just lock up all of our theologians in the room for six weeks, uh, that eventually they'll hash it out and they'll all agree together. And what they're really not seeing, I think, is the underlying presuppositions and, and even wider cultural influences that are driving some of the discussions that are polarizing the conversations. Uh, and, and so really what you have is, is this is um, the first time in Adventist history where you see two different, very different hermeneutics or ways of interpreting inspired writings. And, and I would argue that these two hermeneutical schools that are self-evident in 1919 would go on to shape the debate of pretty much every subsequent theological conflict that the church faced in the 20th century. Mm. I mean, today we still have those labels of conservative, liberal, or progressive, and yeah. or fundamental. Would you say that kind of the way we interpret those terms today is similar to, to kind of how it was in its inception, or has it kind of morphed and grown, or is it, are, the, are the fundamental issues on both sides kind of similar, or has it kind of changed over time? Well, yes and no. It's similar in the sense that these issues even today are still dealing with hermeneutics or how we interpret inspired writings. Uh, but, but yes, the, it's different also in the, in the sense that really what you're seeing is a bunch of people that, um, you know, liberal conservative, what does that mean? These are labels that are often loosely applied. They're hard to nail down. What is a conservative to one person could be a liberal to another. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the personalities have changed. The conflicts, uh, certainly the topics have generally changed for the most part. Uh, and you see more of a fragmenting through the 20th century where there's many more, I would say, hermeneutical schools or maybe subdividing those broader mm -hmm. categories where you're seeing. So it's much more complicated and nuanced. Um, but, but yes, it is similar in the sense that the underlying issue at its most basic level, generally speaking, is somehow related to mm -hmm. interpretation. I mean, I, one of the things I find interesting uh, from reading about this before, and as you just mentioned, was that it was the, the younger people at yeah. 1919 who were the more fundamental. I mean, we often have this idea that the young ones are the progressive. Yeah. Yeah. And they were the conservatives. So they're they're... They're, they're giving this impression that they're the harbingers of conservatism, but they're actually the innovators bringing something new. And that's, that's one of the ironies of, of 1919. But I mean, it, it's the historical fact. It's the historical mm. evidence that, that points to that. So, um, and, and so that just shows that, you know, it, I, I remember a professor used to say, the devil mm. doesn't care which ditch he gets you in as long as he gets you in one, one ditch or the other. So whether the right ditch or the left ditch, Ditch, excuse me. <laughs> the either side, either extreme, um, leads to an unhealthy hermeneutic, and and so and that's that's the danger is a polarization where um, both sides in 1919 were much closer than either side would like to admit, but oftentimes those are closest to us uh, that we should actually be getting along. We tend to polarize, and I, I think that's one of the dangers. That's one of the lessons of 1919 is you know, we can come in and have a conflict and in the course or pursuit of that conflict, instead of actually truly listening to one another, we actually push each other farther apart. In fact, I remember a teacher, he used to say that there should be an 11th commandment, thou shalt mm -hmm. not do theology against thy neighbor. This idea that, uh, you know, we, we tend to polarize. So, and, and this happens in Sabbath schools all the time, doesn't it? You know, you, you come and I come and then we just, you know, put our druthers down and then we begin our theological warfare. And instead of really trying to listen and maybe both sides actually have a point, uh, but at the end of the day, we actually have made the other our theological enemy and we really haven't understood or listened to one another. And, you know, a great example of that in the church today is uh, in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so has been the topic of women's ordination. I have great friends on both sides of that issue. 
Uh, but but very rarely do I see somebody that can actually in clearly articulate mm. the position of those they disagree with, right? And and so um, and, and that's that's the challenge is if, if we take a issue or a topic and say, oh, I'm going to try to nail you down and see whether you're on my side or you're against me, and then we're we're back to this whole problem where we're not listening to one another. I think to me that's one of the great lessons of 1919 and what I love about Adventist history is we're people of the book, we're people of scripture. We need to get on our knees and we need to pray more and and truly listen to one another. And when we have differences and disagreements, uh, rather than gossip at one another or whatever, but uh, to come and say, hey, I, I need to really understand and learn. And, and, and maybe as a world church, we, I, you know, I think that's something that today we could really mm. benefit a lot from is, is, is how do we avoid this, this polarization, right? What would you say are some of the other issues um, that you know, your book title is kind of the, the ongoing impact of fundamentalism. What would you say are some, I mean, you just referenced women's ordination in terms of, I guess that's an issue, for want of a better term, I mean, people vary in their interpretations of, 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 of the same biblical text and or, or book and, and how they interpret and apply that today. But what are right. some of the other, other issues we have grappled with as a church where we've seen the, the rumbling effects of this struggle between how we interpret um, either the Bible or Ellen White and where we put it in our, our structure of authority? Yeah, you know, that's that's a great question. And I think, you know, there's there's a whole host of issues. I, that's why I've written this whole book on this thing. <laughs> and, and I wish we had more time to get into a lot more depth into some of those issues. Uh, some of them were as simple as just Bible translations. How do we mm. how do we deal with different Bible translations? Uh, and what I love is Ellen White, again, very flexible. She used a, quite a variety of Bible translations. Towards the end of her life, as more became available, she used them increasingly more in her own writings. And so mm -hmm. we see some, uh, that's that's kind of interesting. They're, they're debating that in 1919 and saying, hey, actually, you know, we can benefit by using multiple translations for those that aren't conversant in the biblical languages. Another topic that's really controversial and... I've come to appreciate more since even writing my dissertation. I tried to highlight it more in my my uh, recent book from last year on, on 1919 is the topic of the Trinity. Uh, that's a topic that mm. you see a lot of growth in Adventism. It was still a buzz issue um, in 1919. It, it drew some really strong feelings. Mm. Uh, but again, mm. you're starting to see that the church has really... Uh, beginning in a large part has changed and is widely beginning to accept. But there's still a few people that are strongly resistant that are there at 1919 and that are kind of still uncomfortable with the term Trinity and and how we make sense of that. So um, those are a few of them. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the issues in 1919, frankly, if I got into a lot of historical detail with the average church member, they're going to yawn and fall asleep on me because they're just like, really? They were debating that. But but for them, it wasn't just the issues themselves, especially a lot of these eschatological, these little nuanced kinds of things where they're actually seeing um, that they represented something more. They symbolized and they're dealing with change. How do we deal with change? And uh, we don't want to undermine our historic positions. We don't want to just give away like the modernists, these liberals and the wider world of American Christianity that are kind of selling their soul, they're perceived and understood. Yeah, hey, the, 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 this kind of direction that of evolution and historical critical method, that's that's not that's not Adventist. We don't see ourselves as going that direction. So um, so you know, and, and what's interesting is both sides at 1919 see the rising fundamentalist movement as a good thing. Uh, the question is, is just how influenced Adventism was as a result of fundamentalism. That's actually, by the way, where I'm going with my next book right now that I'm really spending a lot of time on. On I've just spent the last year researching and now I've just transitioned to writing. It's going to be a sequel to this. It's probably be about two to three times the size, a, a bit more in depth, looking at Adventism and fundamentalism. Uh, so 1919, I see is really kind of a tipping point. Uh, and and then through the 1920s. So I'm really exploring Adventist theology in the 1920s. And so watch for that to come out in, in the in the not too distant future, sometime before the end of, of this year. Okay, well, that's good. 
appreciate you um, historians like yourself putting out resources like that that can benefit the world church and benefit those who study what would you say are some of the I mean how, how today like for the, for the average church member or someone you know a Christian who's listening to this what can someone do to um, guard themselves against slipping into unhealthy fundamentalism um, is it just how we you know where we view the Bible or with Ella White how we relate that to it what are some basic boundaries or, or framework you could you could point as you could give to someone you know that as a church we or as an individual we should do to, to help avoid you know sure. an unhealthy mindset well I, I think one of the most uh, practical things is you know we need to you know that's why as a church we do theology together that's why we meet together as a church that's why we have you know, theological think tanks like the Biblical Research Institute, because we need to be able to dialogue and engage with one another. When we do theology in isolation, we tend to, um, you know, I'm reminded of a, a friend of mine that was teaching at Wheaton years ago, and he he did sort of a study of uh, his students in life and teachings class. And he would ask them at the beginning of the semester, you know, whether Jesus was, uh, or actually he'd ask them personally whether they were an introvert or an extrovert. And then on the final exam, at the end of the semester, he had a question that didn't count for any points, but was Jesus an introvert or an extrovert? And he had a 99% correlation over several decades of, of teaching uh, that inevitably, if you're an introvert, you thought Jesus was an introvert and, and, and so on. You get the idea, I think. And, and the danger is, is that we make Jesus into our own image. We make the Bible into our own image, make it say what we want it to say. And, and I would even say that we do this with Ellen White, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the danger is we make Ellen White into our own image. And so if the Bible and the spirit of prophecy always agree with us, then we are in trouble. I mean, if we really are reading with an open mind, the Holy Spirit should be convicting us of our unlikeness to Christ and our need to constantly grow in our walk with Jesus. And, and so this is not a, a isolated one-time thing. It's the, Ellen White says, it's the work of a lifetime. So we're constantly growing by beholding Christ. And so uh, we need to read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy with an open mind and an open heart to make, and, and to pray the prayer, Lord, make me teachable. Help me to see what your truth is and apply it to my own life. And so I, I think we have to be very careful. The other thing I think that is an absolute essential uh, litmus test uh, for knowing whether we're doing this in a, in, a, in a correct manner, in a healthy and balanced way, is that ultimately our reading of Scripture and Ellen White's writings should lead us closer to Jesus Christ, uh, which should deepen our experience. I'm, I'm reminded of Ministry of Healing, a page, I think it's page 570, as I recall, where she talks about basically the idea that the closer we come to Jesus, the more we become loving and lovable Christians. It's one of my all-time all favorite uh, quotes by Ellen White. And so I think as, as we study and as we grow spiritually, um, it should make us more loving in our approach. And, and I was, you know, when I was a young pastor years ago, I remember uh, there was a church member that was very obstinate and very difficult. I would say happy Sabbath. And he would say, it is not a happy Sabbath. I mean, just, just very mm. grumpy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he, he considered himself the theological Ellen White police in the church. And so he would go to potluck and he would, I called him the potluck police, actually. Uh, and he'd look and say, oh, that's okay. That's okay. And then, oh, that one. No, no, no. That's not according to spirit of prophecy. Mm. And uh, I mean, he, he actually did some damage, hurt mm -hmm. some people. Mm -hmm. And so I had a young person that uh, her husband was not a church member. And so I saw him in the parking lot. I ran outside, said, come on in. And I thought, you know, I got to make sure. Uh, and, and he said, let me run home and grab some fish. And I thought, oh, no. Um, you know, don't worry about it. We got lots of food. He said, no, I have to get my fish. So he did go home and get the fish. And I thought of Mr. Potluck police that trying to be a good pastor, fall on your sword and distract this person. Right. And so I saw him and, and so eventually he came in, I saw him and he brought his fish to potluck and, and there was a Mr. Potluck police. I'm chatting with him. And, and after a few minutes, I couldn't distract him. I, I was trying to engage him. And he just said, you know, uh, with a, with words of disgust as he's, Notice he smelled the fish. <laughs> Said somebody brought fish to potluck, <laughs> and I think the Holy Spirit gave me a little bit of boldness. Yeah, they don't teach this in seminary, okay? And uh, I, I said to him, "What do you do with the fact that Jesus ate fish?" 
right? Mm. And he looked at me and he said, but Jesus didn't have all the truth. He didn't have Ellen White. Oh, See, if goodness. Jesus had Ellen White, he would have known he's supposed to be vegetarian. And uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I think this is really this, you know, uh, some people, you know, it, it's it, 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 this is very extreme, mm-hmm. very extreme. But, you know, our hermeneutics, our way of interpreting scripture, I believe, if done faithfully, should should convict our hearts, should should grow us. We should, you know, be able to grow and, and a, you know, a high view of scripture that this is God's word. It's inspired. But it should also make us more loving and lovable on the way that we treat one another. And so to me, those are kind of the litmus tests of, of hermeneutics, as I understand it, especially for Melanie White. I mean, she when she's alive, she's re reinforcing this all the time um don't take my word for it go and study the bible and when there's debates in the church over nuances of prophetic interpretation just say hey, leave my writings alone go wrestle with the word of god i mean she's she i could give you so many different examples of that and and really that same struggle that tension that challenge uh which by the way is also an opportunity that's really what we see happening once again in 1919 uh, and so this is this is why at its most basic essence, I think uh, there's a lot that we have mm. to learn from 1919. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for joining us. I think you know when I often think about the pioneers, I think that they were a lot more a lot more balanced than we than we sometimes idolize or, or mystify them to be. And especially Ellen White, she was extremely balanced. And I think sometimes the further we are removed in time from them, we we uh, we are prone to highlight aspects of their life we want to highlight and ignore the other parts and i think there were a lot more uh, you know and this was the first time that you know we were post pioneers post ellen white and i think we've been struggling with this since and how we remember the pioneers to be or how we remember ellen white to be and uh, and we don't always do thorough study of what they said on a particular subject and how they how ellen white related to the bible and you know fact that she used various translations meant that we shouldn't just be you know kjv only people or things like this uh today thank you for sharing with us and thank you for um joining us and thank you for writing the book that you did right i mean if someone is interested in getting your book is it available online is there a kindle version is it you know what are the options for them yeah great question uh yeah it should be available through adventist book centers adventistbookcenter.com it is available on amazon and you can get it on kindle and at the moment, there is in production a uh, audiobook version that I hope to have out sometime later this year. Okay, okay, appreciate that. Well, thank you, thank you for being with us and sharing just a very brief and broad overview of the 1919 Bible Conference and and the you know some of the things that we grapple with then are some of the things that we struggle with today. If you could give someone maybe just maybe the last question I'll ask you, sure, and uh, hopefully I'm not taking you off guard. Um, not so much your book. Your book is, you know, it's its own resource on its own. But if yeah. you were to give someone another resource on kind of reading, studying, and, and hermeneutics, so to speak, if they wanted to kind of, you know, delve into that subject a little bit more, are there any books or resources you'd you'd kind of highlight for them that would help them in their study that that way? Yeah, you know, um, there are quite a number of of good resources about how to correctly interpret scripture and inspired writings. Uh, Just off the top of my head, uh, when it comes to Ellen White, there's uh, the Ellen White Encyclopedia, which I, you know, I think is, has just a a masterful collection of articles from over 200 scholars. And that kind of really delves into Adventist history and Ellen White and some really great uh, historical pieces in there to try to flesh out what that means. Uh, And then the Biblical Research Institute has had a number of helpful books come out the last couple of years uh, that all relate to biblical interpretation. And I'm sorry, you caught me off guard, so I can't remember the title exactly, but uh, uh, I'm reminded of, I think, Eckhart Mueller, you search his name. Yeah, he's got a couple of really great uh, articles that I've used for my students. And for example, like my biblical theology class that just really break it down very easily and i think they're available on the biblical research institute uh website yeah they do have a lot of resources mm-hmm. on there yeah. okay well appreciate i like to, once again thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing and thank you for the the work you do in educating people on adventist history 
there at Southwestern and, and further afield as you, as you travel and as you share in other places. For those of us, you who are listening to us, thank you for joining us on the Lineage Journey podcast. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Lineage Journey podcast and join us in a few weeks time for our next one. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Lineage Journey is supported by your generous donations. Did you know that you can donate on a monthly basis? Any amount from $2 to 100 or whatever you decide through patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. Your donations go towards the cost of producing our varied content and we thank you for your support.